Uh, and now, uh, we're going to have our third keynote of QSEC. Uh, so this is my prof, Greg Wilson. I took a lot of classes with him. Uh, I know all his jokes by now, but they're really good and you'll enjoy them. Uh, so we're, does, it, does anybody use Stack Overflow? No. Yes. Uh, okay, I guess so. So uh, a few, uh, I guess two months ago, they put together this event. Um, uh, called Dev Days, and a few of us QSEC people were there kind of recruiting and scouting out for speakers. Uh, and uh, after Greg was done, so Greg was invited, he gave his talk, and uh, I sent a text message to Abdullah saying, like, we gotta, we gotta invite Greg back. Uh, he spoke before, we usually don't uh, reinvite speakers uh, so soon, but we're like, you know, we gotta break the rules and invite him. I said that to Abdullah, and, and I received a text message at the same time, and Abdullah's like, you know, we gotta get this guy back. Uh, so I guess it's kind of sealed the deal. I went to Greg and he agreed to come. Uh, so here he is, and this is Greg Wilson. Thank you. Okay, hands up if you've got a hangover. That's what I thought. Hands up if you're from Waterloo. Oh, okay, I'll speak slowly and use small words. Um, <laughs> more interesting to me, and, and you'll figure out why at the end of the talk, hands up those people that were born outside Canada. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, those whose parents were born, one or other parent was born outside Canada. How many people, you've got to go back a couple of generations before somebody's from overseas? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I was born in Canada. My dad is Australian. And if you go back to my great, great grandfather, male line all the time, the guy's name was John McColl, and he was actually shipped to Australia as a convict in 1856 on the second to last boatload of prisoners sent to Botany Bay. And the interesting thing about that is we don't know what he did. Right? What the, all they recorded at the Australian end was, do not return to sender. Don't give us this one back. Right? <laughs> the records of the court case and his conviction were all in Glasgow, and they were destroyed in 1941 during the German bombings of the shipyards. Now, there are microfilmed copies of those, bad microfilm done hastily two generations ago that had been in a vault in Edinburgh slowly moldering away. In there, there will be a couple of lines of handwriting about one John McColl explaining why he was sentenced to life in the colonies. And if any of you have an interest in handwriting recognition or that side of AI, I'd really like you to tackle this. One of the reasons I went and did my master's degree in Edinburgh was I thought, maybe I can take a stab at this. Then I looked at how much there was and how primitive the technology was. This is going back to before most of you were born. And I thought, yeah, I'll leave this for another generation. Um, the reason I bring this up, though, is whenever I got anything wrong, whenever I did anything bad as a kid, my mom would turn to my dad and say, this is your side of the family. <laughs> There's a footnote to that. Um, we never knew much about my mother's mother's family until about 10 years ago. Uh, my sister got into genealogy after my dad retired, and she came back from the Ontario Provincial Archives one evening, eight months pregnant, big smile on her face, waddles in the door and said, I found him. I found mom's granddad. Turns out that my maternal great-grandfather was a Methodist minister in Windsor, Ontario. And in 1892, he hopped on the overnight train headed west with all of the church's money. <laughs> and the 15-year-old daughter of one of his parishioners <laughs> without saying goodbye to his wife and kids. We have heard so much less from my mom about your side of the family since this one came up. <laughs> Think about how much has changed. Right now, if I want to find out about my great-great-grandfather's conviction, I'm going to have to go and read approximately 70,000 sheets of microfiche to look for two lines of text. I can't Google it. It took us almost 10 years to track down the record for my great-grandfather. You guys are upset if it takes more than 15 seconds to find the answers to last year's version of the question that's on the assignment in front of you. <laughs> right? Some things have changed out of all recognition. Sadly, the way we build software hasn't. There is nothing that you do day by day that wouldn't have been familiar to me 25 years ago. Yes, you're using more powerful machines. Yes, you are using browsers and, oh God, JavaScript and you know, all this other stuff. But the way you work day to day has not improved. What I'm gonna talk about in the next, well, until Andrew tells me to shut up, is 
what we actually know about software development and how I believe it's going to change over the next 10 years. So let me start with another history lesson. Once upon a time, there was a seven years war, which actually lasted longer than seven years. The British, yeah, okay. How many people are from Toronto? I've got one more joke and then I'll get to the talk, okay. So the joke is the guy goes into the supermarket, gets you know a couple hundred things, drops them on the eight items or less counter. No one looks at him and says, okay, are you from Ryerson and you can't read? Or York and you can't count? Or Toronto and you think, oh, it doesn't mean me. <laughs> okay, so. Seven Years' War. Britain lost about 1,500 sailors over the course of that war to enemy action. And the population of a small city to scurvy. Hands up if you've ever seen pictures of what scurvy looks like. Okay, your gums go black and swell up, your fingernails fall out, your teeth fall out, and then the bad stuff starts. It's a horrible way to go. It's vitamin C deficiency. What makes this ironic is that even before that war had started, a Scottish surgeon named James Lind had done what was probably the first controlled medical experiment in history. So he noticed that if you pickle food, it doesn't go bad. So he thought, what if we can pickle the sailors? <laughs> well, but it's not an intrinsically crazy idea. Okay, it's an, knowing what we know now, it's a little bit crazy. If somebody volunteered to do this with me, I would, no thank you, right? But his idea was, whatever it is that's preserving the food, maybe we can get that into the sailors and it will preserve them and they won't rot because Really, scurvy looks like you're rotting alive. So he took a dozen sailors, broke them into six groups, and tried cider, a weak solution of sulfuric acid, bad day to be those guys, <laughs> vinegar, seawater as a control, oranges, and barley water. And guess what? Within a few days, the guys getting the orange juice not only did, stopped degrading, they got better. So he wrote up his results and published it, and the Navy ignored him because he wasn't a proper English gentleman. It wasn't until the late 1700s when a proper Englishman repeated this study that the Navy paid attention. And there are a lot of historians who believe that the fact that the British cottoned on to this before anybody else was one of the reasons they came out of the Napoleonic Wars on top. Their Navy won the war for them. That blockade was the most effective instrument they had and it all traces back to the fact that they could keep their ships at sea longer than anybody else. And by the way, this is where the term limey comes from. Right? A limey is a British sailor, or these days I guess generally a Brit. The British expeditions into the South Pacific and going around Africa all carried lime trees and planted them on every speck of land they could find. James Cook planted lime orchards all through the South Pacific so that the next set of ships would be able to get fresh lime juice so that the sailors could keep going, right? Well, it took a long time for the medical profession to figure out that controlled studies are actually the right way to find new things. Take the 1950s. Hill and Dahl did the very first case control study comparing smokers with non-smokers. You see, in the 1920s, there was an epidemic of lung cancer. Prior to the First World War, lung cancer was so rare that single cases would be written up in journal articles. It's actually a very difficult disease to get. But by the 1920s, we're seeing thousands of men with lung cancer. Now, we know today it's because of cigarettes, but that wasn't clear in the 1920s. That's the same time that cars are becoming much more widely used, so there's exhaust fumes in the air. Maybe that's the cause. There's electrical lines running overhead. Maybe that's the cause. I mean, we don't know. It wasn't until the 1950s that Hill and Dahl took over, I think it was about 1,500 British doctors, split them into two groups, and looked at those that were smoking and those that weren't, and looked at the incidence of lung cancer. Right? It's the longest running medical study that's ever been done. It didn't wind down until 2001 when the last of the original subjects finally passed away. Okay? They published their results and we discovered a couple of things. Number one, it was unequivocal in the mid-1950s. Smoking causes lung cancer. Hands up those people who smoke. Okay, stop. Please, I hate burying students. Second. The other thing we found is that most people would rather fail than change. Most people are so scared of change that they will come up with all sorts of excuses as to why they shouldn't do it, even when the evidence is put in front of them that it will make their lives better. All right. This quotation, what happens on average, is of no help when one is faced with a specific patient. That's a quotation from the head of the British Medical Association when this study was published. What's the point of doing all this statistics and all these controlled experiments? I've got a man with lung cancer in front of me. Your statistics are of no use. Completely misunderstanding the point. The point is that if we ask a question carefully, and if we're willing to be humble enough to admit when we're wrong, to look at the data, 
then we can find out how the universe actually works and then we can do things based on that knowledge. Right? Uh, there's a professor at McMaster, Sackett, coined the term evidence-based medicine in 1992. And today, randomized double-blind trials are the gold standard for medicine. You cannot put a new drug or a new treatment on the market unless you've passed that test. And I strongly urge that you go and have a look at the Cochrane Collaboration site. How many people here either believe that vaccines cause autism or know somebody who believes that vaccines cause autism? Right? There will be a few, okay? The raw data from over 50 studies is available for you to analyze on the Cochrane Collaboration site, along with all of the papers based on that. You don't have to take somebody's word for it. You can go dig through and do your own analysis and find out that there's no signal there, that there is no causative correlation. Right? This is wonderful. And it would have been possible before the internet, but the internet certainly brings it to a wider audience. You can go and have a look at climate data. You can go and have a look at economic data, and you can see for yourself whether there's cause and effect, and if so, whether it's strong enough that you want to act on it. Well, now let's take a look at software engineering. This is Martin Fowler. <clears throat> he wrote the book on refactoring. He's way smarter than I am. You know, I read his blog. Every single time he posts, I learn something. Very deep and careful thinker about software and software design. And last summer in IEEE software, he had an article on domain-specific languages, this notion that you build a tiny language in which the solution to your, to your original problem is easy to express. And in that, he said, using DSLs leads to improved programmer productivity and better communication with domain experts. Okay? Now, I, I want to show you what happened here. One of the smartest guys in our industry made two substantive claims of fact in an academic journal, and there's not a single citation in the paper. Not a single footnote or reference. There is no data to back up this claim. And now, please note, I'm not saying that Martin's wrong in his claims. I'm saying that what we have here is a Scottish verdict. Right. Courts in Scotland are allowed to return one of three verdicts. Innocent, guilty, or not proven. Arguments in favor of DSLs, arguments in favor of functional programming languages making parallelism easier, or agile development leading to tenfold return on investment, or whatever, are unproven. It doesn't mean they're wrong, it doesn't mean they're right, it means we don't know, and we should be humble enough to admit that. Okay? Carrying on in that same article, Martin says, debate still continues about how valuable DSR is in. I believe that debate's hampered by because not enough people know how to develop DSLs effectively. Crap. I think the debate is handled by low standards of proof. Right? The listening to computer scientists argue, listening to software engineers in industry argue, it seems that the accepted standard of proof is I've had two beer and there's this anecdote about a tribe in New Guinea from one of Scott Birkin's books that seems to vaguely be applicable. Therefore, I'm right. Well, no. Sorry, but that's not proof. And you should have higher standards than that. The good news is we are starting to see things improve. Since the mid-1990s, inspired by the, particularly by the work of people like Barbara Kitchenham, there's been a growing emphasis in software engineering research on empirical studies. Um, I was at the International Conference on Software Engineering in Vancouver last May. Almost every paper that described a new tool or a new development practice had in it the results of some sort of field study. Not just, I built this and I think it's cool, but I put this in front of 20 developers for three weeks and here's what happened. Yes, it's difficult, sometimes very expensive, to do these studies. Yes, they can be flawed or incomplete. I mean, most of the studies in the literature use the standard academic guinea pig, which is undergraduate students desperate for free pizza. That definitely biases the results. I mean, I think it was interesting that when Andrew's announcing the party, the first thing he says isn't, there's going to be a great band. The first thing he says is free food. He knows what you're after. Okay? A lot of these studies are flawed. They're incomplete. But the standards are going up every single year. We are learning more and more from fields like social psychology and perceptual psychology and econometrics. How do you do these studies well and what constitutes proof? It's almost impossible now to get a paper about a new tool or a new methodology in software engineering accepted in a top tier journal or conference without having taken it out and tried it in the real world. And that's progress. Right? Here's an example of what I mean by results. 
This is Jorge Aranda and Steve Easterbrook from 2005. I'm going to break you into three groups. Oh, conveniently, you have broken yourself into three groups. Okay. I'm going to give you a two-page spec of a change that I want made in a website. You're the control group. You get the description of the change I want made, and in the middle of the second page, it says, I'd like to give an estimate, but I've got no experience with that. We'll wait for your calculations. Okay? You guys are group A. You get exactly the same spec, but instead of those two sentences, I insert with no highlighting, no underlining. I don't try to draw attention to it. It's in the middle of a paragraph. I say, I've got no experience with software projects, but I guess this will take about two months to finish. You guys get the hint that it's going to take about 20 months. Every other piece of information you've got about the existing project and the scale of the change is identical, and you don't know that this is what I'm varying between the three groups. Guess what happens? The lowball group estimates an average of 5.1 months, regardless of how much experience they have in the domain, how much experience they have in software development in general, what technique they're using, how familiar they are with the tools. None of that has any statistical bearing on the results. That hint buried in the middle of a paragraph on the second page drives the difference between 5.1 months, 7.8, and 15.4. It's called an anchoring effect. It's well known from psychology. And what this means is all the work that's been done on software estimation to date is pretty much pointless because what the engineers are going to give us back is what they think we want to hear. Okay? Isn't that a useful thing to know before somebody tries to sell you an estimation tool or methodology? Right? And there are lots of people doing that. Hands up if you're from IBM. Okay? How many people have come in and said, we need you to fill in these forms because we're building our estimates to put together the Gantt chart? And what we do is we start with wild-ass guesses that you pulled out of thin air, but then we've got all this software to assemble them to make them look meaningful. Right? <laughs> if I sound cynical, it's because I am. Okay. <laughs> now, those of you thinking about graduate school, hands up if you're thinking about grad school. Okay, every time I present a result, you should be thinking, what's the next study I would do? Here, we've got a beautiful study that shows an anchoring effect on this kind of time scale. What happens if we're doing agile development and the time scale is a day or a couple of weeks? Am I getting the same percentage error, the same percentage effect in my estimates? If so, I'm not going to be any better over the lifetime of the agile project because, yeah, on any given iteration, I'm only off by a few hours. But over the course of the year, those hours add up to be weeks or months. Right? We haven't done that study. We don't know what happens if instead of saying, I think this is going to take a few months, I tell you it's going to take a few hours. Do you become more percentage accurate or not? That would be useful to know. If you do become more accurate when you're estimating shorter things, that's a powerful argument in favor of using agile methods. I've seen people make that argument over and over again, but there's no data to back it up. Let's go get the data and find out if we're right. Here is what is probably the most widely misquoted result in software engineering. All right. The best programmers are up to 28 times more productive than the worst. You've all heard this, all right. except the number has varied. Some people say 10 times better, 100 times better, 40. I'm going to pick a number that's big enough to be impressive, but not so big that you're going to doubt me. All right. Do a Google for this on the web. You will find dozens of variations on this claim. You will find entire books written about hiring programmers and doing startups that say, look, all you need is a few really, really good people, right? Because they'll be 100 times more productive than them, right? And you know, mentally, of course, we're all putting ourselves at one end of the bell curve. We're not saying, oh, yeah, I'm one of the stupid ones. OK, well, let's take this claim apart, shall we? First, the study was done in 1968. Hands up if you were alive in 1968, okay? <laughs> right? The world has changed a little bit since then. Does batch programming with punch cards behave the same way as interactive programming on a Macintosh with an interface that looks like it was designed for a three-year-old by three-year-olds? Anyway, <laughs> not a fan. Yeah, yeah, you see? People say, that your generation is less religious? Now nah, you bring up Mac versus PC, you'll find out about religion. <laughs> okay. Second, the original paper does not describe how productivity was measured. We have no idea what their metric was. Third, if you compare the best to the worst, you're going to exaggerate any effect. I mean, if you compare the best driver in the world to the worst driver in the world, the best driver is infinitely better because the worst driver is dead. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay? I don't drive, and there's a good reason for that, right? We should be looking at standard deviations around the mean. I mean, this is just bad statistics. This is awful statistics, right? Turns out it was 12 programmers for an afternoon, none of whom had any formal training as programmers because it's 1968. Everybody's a self-taught programmer in 1968. They start as mathematicians or physicists or linguists. Best programmer I ever worked with. Uh, had actually, his only higher education was two years at a rabbinical college in New York. He said, yeah, basically programming is about being very precise about the words mean and making, you know, splitting hairs. We've been doing this longer than you have. Right? <laughs> he was very good, okay? Now, the next major study done in the early 1980s was 54 programmers. Wow, that's a lot more people. The longest subject ran for 63 minutes. Right? So all of the claims you're reading about the relative productivity of programmers can be traced back to 12 people in 1968 for an afternoon or 54 people for an hour. How confident are you in those claims now? Me. Okay, so what do we know? We actually do know a fair bit. I'm not going to tell you what we know. Instead, I'm going to encourage all of you who are currently Twittering to switch over to Google and look at the work of Lutz Prescheldt. He's a professor in Germany, and he's been doing some very good work on productivity variations between programmers, the effect of language. He's got a paper just out. What's the effect of the web programming framework on people's productivity? Yes, these studies are expensive. They're hard to do. But let's face it, bringing a new drug to market costs anywhere between half a billion and three billion dollars today. All right. By the time you do all the studies, by the time you're in production, ballpark, one and a half billion dollars. Okay. I, I don't need that. I'll take 10% of that. For $150 million, I believe I could do dozens of interesting studies in empirical software engineering, the results of which would probably have, what, 5%, 10% improvement in the productivity of the average programmer? Okay. So I can take a half trillion dollar a year industry worldwide and boost productivity by 5%. What's that as a return on $150 million? 5% of half a trillion over $150 million is lots, right? I'm, I have a degree in mathematics. I don't actually calculate with numbers. I just, right? Big O of lots, okay? <laughs> one, of the th one of the pieces of folklore that Lutz actually confirmed is that productivity and reliability depend on the length of the program text independent of the language level. You will produce roughly the same number of working lines of code if you're writing an assembly per hour as you will produce in Ruby or Scheme or Perl or Java. Right? Your output in terms of text per hour is roughly constant. That's a pretty cool result. It argues that we ought to be using the highest level language that we can because you can do a lot more with 10 lines of Python than you can do with 10 lines of assembly. The problem, of course, and I'm seeing a couple of people frown, is um, as, as somebody once said, platform independent programs have platform independent performance. Right? If you're writing a very high level, your performance is going to be right in the basement. But at least now we can start doing what engineers have done in other domains for, over a couple, for at least a couple of centuries. We can start making trade-offs. If I use this very high level language, I'm going to need 10 times as many servers to get performance, but my code will be working next Thursday, not next year. Okay, now it becomes an economics question. And engineering is really what happens when you take science and economics and try to put them together. Okay. It's nice to have the data on which to make decisions. Here's, here's another classic result with some implications. This goes all the way back to Barry Beam's work in the mid-1970s. Result number one, and this has been validated in lots of other domains by lots of other studies. Most errors are introduced during requirements analysis and design. That's the hard part of software. It's not writing and debugging any particular piece of code. It's figuring out what are we supposed to build and how are the pieces going to fit together. Okay? Second, the later a bug is removed, the more expensive it is to take it out. If you can catch a bug in the design phase, it costs an hour to fix. You catch that same bug after you've coded, it could be 10 hours. You catch it after you've released a customer, not only are you on the wrong end of a lawsuit, but it's cost you 100 hours to fix. It really is orders of magnitude as you go from one stage to the next. Why is this interesting? Well, it explains, I believe, the two major schools of software development. Pessimists and optimists, right? The traditional people and the agilistas. The pessimists say, look, we're going to tackle that hump in the error curve. If we can eliminate bugs in the design and analysis phase, 
so that fewer get through, our total cost will come down. So let's put our effort up front where the hard bugs are and cut the number that are getting out here to the expensive part of the fixing curve. That makes perfect economic sense. The Agilista's view is let's take that curve and shrink it and then stitch lots of them together. The total area under the solid curve in that bottom diagram is much less than the total area under the dotted curve. If I do iterations of two weeks, maybe the total time I spend fixing bugs is less than if I do one long iteration of a year. These are both testable hypotheses and there are groups around the world right now gathering the data to test them. It would be wonderful to know which if either is right because then you could build your software development process around facts instead of around bestsellers. So why does this matter? Well, here's a rather disappointing, at least to me personally, snippet of conversation from a bulletin board at the University of Toronto a couple of years ago, three years ago now. We were talking about why there are so few women in computing and a senior student with very good grades who's about to get a bachelor's degree from Canada's self-proclaimed best university. Don't rag me on this, please. Just let that one go, right? He said, yeah, I just always believe there are fundamental differences between the sexes and women just aren't as good at this stuff, okay? So I said, what data are you basing that opinion on? His reply was, and I quote, it's more of an unrefuted hypothesis based on personal observation. I've read a few studies on the topic and found them unconvincing. Oh, okay. Unrefuted hypothesis based on personal observation. That's a long-winded way of saying bullshit, <laughs> okay? I have read a few studies on the topic and I find them unconvincing. Which studies? Now, he didn't reply to that part, despite several promptings, okay? Let me show you what it looks like when grown-ups are having this conversation. Chechi and Williams, why aren't more women in science? This is an absolutely brilliant book, even if you don't care about gender inequity in science. You've got 20, top flight researchers, roughly half of whom believe the explanation is nature, it's genetic, and half of whom believe it's nurture. They're writing alternate chapters. They're arguing with each other. Here's some reasons why there's intrinsic genetic bias that make women either less capable or less interested in computing. And the next chapter is, yes, yes, that's very nice, professor. Here's what you got wrong. Let me explain your own results back to you. And the next one says, well, actually, you should have interpreted the data this way. This is a grown-up conversation between well-informed people who are merciless, absolutely merciless, in picking apart one another's logical flaws. How many of you have ever been part of a debating society? Debate, okay. You know what this is like when somebody comes at you and will, oh, I see a little hairline crack. I can get the crowbar in and there goes your argument. This is the best example I've seen recently of what science looks like in action when people who've spent 30 years tackling the problem don't know what the answer is, but they are intimately familiar with one another's work and reasoning. Right? They're all very polite, but it's that kind of icy politeness you get at the wedding when you know, people bump into each other and go, oh, yes, <clears throat> how are you, right? <laughs> it's nice. Um, just, just to pick one result out of this that I didn't know. Um, Susan Dweck's work, absolutely brilliant work out at the University of British Columbia. Uh, I think she's still there. I'm going to split you into two groups this time. I'm going to have you do a task that you haven't done before. I'm going to tell you guys that research shows there's a genetic component to this. There's an aptitude. And if you have it, you'll do well. And if you don't have the aptitude, you'll do less well. I'll tell you guys that research shows that this is entirely practice-based. The more you practice, the better you'll be. Guess what? You guys will all do worse. Even if I say, we've got evidence that shows that men are better at this than women, the men will do worse. As soon as you believe that there's something intrinsic in the aptitude, then the first time you can't do something, the first time it's hard, you'll say, well, I guess I just don't have the gene. You'll talk yourself out of doing it. It doesn't matter whether you're in the in group or the out group. Both groups do less well when they believe there is something intrinsic in the ability. Now think about how we present programming ability culturally. Right? There's very strong signals that are being picked up from a very early age to say, well, some people got it and some people don't. Right? And it's got a lot to do with which washroom you use. It's not surprising, given that, that we're seeing the, what, 5 to 1, 6 to 1 ratio in undergrad classes, the 200 to 1 ratio at Dev Days in November. Right? It's nice to have people doing this kind of research. Don't you wish there was that kind of research about programming? 
So here's a few results that we've got that you ought to be taking into account. Uh, Woodfield, 1979, it's been replicated a few times. If you increase the problem description's complexity by 25%, you double the complexity of the solution. It's nonlinear because of interaction effects. If I add just a few more features, how big your solution is and how hard it is to make it work will double. You've all run into this, right? You all know that adding one more feature makes everything else break. The beautiful thing about this is that we can drive it backwards. If I'm allowed to pick one quarter of the, one quarter of the features that the prof has asked for in the assignment and say, no, I'm not going to do those, it will dramatically reduce the complexity of the assignment. If I get to throw away a quarter of the requirements, I can bring in better code a lot faster, and it's not a linear effect either. Maybe this is why Agile works. Maybe it's because at each stage, they're using much smaller chunks and getting rid of more interaction effects. That would be a really nice thesis. Anybody who's interested, I'm easy to find. Okay, a result you've probably heard. Biggest causes of project failure are poor estimation and unstable requirements, neither of which